Burley So. Hello everybody and welcome back to Burley So. I'm your host Purified and today I've got a special video. I brought in a guest, a good friend of mine, it was in sewing machine repair for 13 years and what we're going to do is we're going to do a little Q&A with him to get some do's and don'ts, some of the common problems that he saw uh, working in the shop and I uh, hope you guys enjoy the video. All right, so here's my friend Brian. Hi. Uh, we go way back from high school. Yeah, it's been a long time. And it turns out back then this guy was fixing sewing machines. <laughs> so um, the reason why I brought you here is obviously your, exp your experience with sewing machines. Um, I, I do a lot of videos on YouTube right now, um, just kind of basic how-tos, projects, some embroidery, stuff like that. The, everybody that usually watches the channel um, knows that I've got the brother SC400, but I think what we can do is we can talk about more than just that machine today. And I don't, I don't know. Why, do you want to give your little history first, or how do you want to get started? Well, I, I guess um, I, I guess I should say yeah. I've, I've, I did repairs for 13 years. A lot of it was in the field for a number of years. Uh, you know, back when middle schools and high schools used to have sewing, you'd get to fix 30 machines at a pop every oh, day of the summer yeah while they're out of school sure so that was a hell of a training ground uh, you get to see the same thing over and over again and, and a lot of common yeah. commonalities yeah. to what was going around and, and there was a couple of retail locations in, in the uh, uh, southeastern Wisconsin area I've worked at uh, uh, including you know a FOF dealer uh, a big Viking dealer uh, I used to work on a lot of singers um, we used to sell brothers, uh, saw tons of brothers, um, so I, and I've worked on Elnos and just about everything. I, I think I've seen just about. <laughs> I feel like I've seen everything. Um, I bet you probably have. Yeah. So we had a lot of different things come in the door uh, that I would end up uh, having to take care of, and, and it, it ranged from everything from, you know, uh, machines from the the turn of the 20th century to, uh, you know. Seven thousand dollar computerized embroidery machine. Sure, sure. Um, with big touch color touch screens and all that. Right, and I've um, seen some of those. I, I've yeah. yearned after those. Yeah, yeah. And we've yeah. got our little cheap three hundred dollar brother here that I use. Hey, no, it gets the job done. It does. Know? It's done some great it's things. Been, yeah, no. So, um, like, as an entry level, you know, some of the, the lower price, I think, is probably what we're going to talk about oh, today. Sure. Yeah. You know, maybe four hundred on down. Yeah. Um, I don't know what's a common what's the, mo the most common issue or common complaint walking into the shop that that you, that you would get I think most people ended up walking in our store uh, because of threading issues it's it's really easy mistake to make uh, especially with some of the older machines the newer ones they they kind of try to simplify it by giving you special guides and, and, and where it just sort of falls into place and, and they, they number it and diagram it so you kind of know where you're going and they have a little threader and all that that, that gets the job done. Right, and I've, um, I've done a video on that so just to kind of go through that you guys can sure. check out the video through this link right here. But uh, and, and a lot of times, but in, in older machines you know you had to make sure you got in every little guide and had to get in between those tension discs. The discs are still in there we just have this guide now where, where to, to help it get into place so you don't even have to think about it. Um, but nonetheless, uh, people still make mistakes. You know, I, I see people skip over an entire path here where it usually comes off a spool, goes around, down, up, and down again, and they'll miss one of the downs, you know, sure. so it'll go across and, and you won't get the proper take up. Um, they may thread it with the foot down. Okay. If the foot is down, you know, your tension isn't released in there. So the thread's not going to get in there when I you actually, lay it in there. When I first started, and I'd, I'd break a thread or something like that, and I'd have the foot down, I'd notice that the thread wouldn't flow freely. Yeah. And it took me a couple of minutes to figure out that yeah. I had to have the, the presser foot in the upward position. And if you want to check and see if you have tension, um, if, if say you're sure you threaded it right, you're still getting globs of thread underneath the fabric, which is usually the symptom of having no tension or a misthreaded tension. It's all globby underneath and it may jam up, it may not, it just may look like a bunch of loops and stuff. Um, you know, thread it, get get down and then start coming back up. And then at that point where you go around and come back up, put your foot down and then see, and do it while you're pulling on the thread and you'll feel the change. 
Okay. Presuming you have your tension set appro appropriately. I mean, if it's on zero, you may not feel a change. Okay. But if it's on... So there's some discs in there that, cre that yeah. create that tension? Yeah. And this dial is kind of like a spring in there, pushing on it harder as you go up in number. Okay. And so, yeah, if, if it, once once uh, this foot goes down, it clamps on the thread, you should feel... You should feel the change. That's a, this is good timing because I just posted a video on tension. Yeah. And it was more or less I did some stitches that showed what it looks like with zero tension to nine. Yeah. And then I sandwiched some thicker materials and then how you can adjust to get that that that, that thread hooked in in the middle of those that sandwiched yeah. materials. Yeah. All right. So you just told you answered my question about the discs and how that works. Yeah. About the tension discs and so at at this point we came off the spool, we went through the tension with the foot up, down, and then back up, and every sewing machine has a take-up lever. Uh, and this is probably another common threading problem that gets people in the door. A th the thread may fall out of the take-up lever, or you may miss it while threading, if your needle isn't up, for instance. Usually you don't see the take-up lever, and it's, it's inside here, you can't see it in this particular model, but some of the older models have it where it sticks out. Um, yeah, and if you look inside your machine, you can see that little metal, it's like a little metal bar with yeah. kind of a little hook circle-ish type thing. That's right. There. A lot of times you can see it. Some of them are actually really buried in there, and okay. you, you don't, but but most, most in my experience, you can usually... I know this one has a little gap right here. Yeah, you, you can, can totally see it. see it right there. Yeah. So if you miss that, and that's in place when the needle is all the way up, so you want to make sure you get the needle up, um, and then you can get that take-up lever. If it falls out of there... Um, that take-up lever is basically doing the job. If you've ever hand-stitched, you know, you stick it, you stick the needle through there, and then you pull it and you go like this, pull it tight, and then you pull it tight. Well, that's what the, the, the take-up lever is doing. Every stitch, it's pulling it tight. So the, the needle goes down, it gets hooked, and, and then uh, it, it, the needle comes back up, and the take-up take lever comes up and yanks that thread around your bottom case and forms a stitch. So if you miss that, you can imagine that the, the thread will collect down below and it'll jam up and that causes a lot of problems. And I, and I get posts about that. I hear, I hear yeah. people that say when they've got a project after they're done sewing, they've got a, a big mess, a little bird's nest of... Yep, that's either, it's either tension or take up. Okay, it's good Nine take times away. out of 10. Um, things that can happen um, in your tension, you can get lint in there. Okay. Uh, and sometimes that'll cause it to not have tension. So lint up in here? In the tension discs. Okay. You, Blowing it, it out, taking an air compressor, air that, can. That can be helpful, and it, it doesn't hurt anything. I, some, some, I've heard mechanics say, you don't want to blow air in your machine, and um, I don't really subscribe to that. I think you can blow a little bit of air in your machine. Okay. Uh, I mean, when, when we used to service them on the workbench, we would open them all up, and we would use compressed air, but naturally... Um, all the covers are off. I think what most uh, technicians are worried about is that when you blow out your machine, you may be pushing the lint into the machine where it gets compacted into gears and other moving parts. Okay. So that's, I think, so that's you're just that moving the up. problem to somewhere else. If that's... Yeah, yeah, but right. I mean, once in a while, I, I, I think you can, especially if you clean down below in the bobbin case area, which yeah. is something that anybody can realistically do. Right, and I've got a video out there I showed them where I could take off, mm -hmm. where they could just take off the two screws. Under most circumstances, yeah, it's pretty easy to get under there. Yeah. It's usually a user serviceable thing. In fact, these screws are wide slotted because they're to accommodate a nickel. You yeah. can use a nickel or a dollar or a penny on them to, to yeah. loosen it up, which is really nice because most screwdrivers are really, yeah, you can't get tall. in there. So, so yeah, if, if you have a tension problem and you think there might be some lint in there, you know, you threaded it, you went down, you pulled it up, you put the foot down, you don't feel the change, it's set to five, six, four, whatever your normal number is for your machine, um, then you, you may have a problem in your tension discs. And nine times out of ten, it's, it's probably going to be lint, especially if you use it a lot, you know. Right. Um, all right. So that, 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 those are two main problems that happen, you know, tension issues, maybe it's not in the take-up. Both of these will cause uh, thread jam problems and that sort of thing. Um, another thing I've noticed in, in in more modern machines is these vertical, these horizontal spool pins. Uh, what people fail to realize is if, if you don't use the appropriate size cap for the size spool you have, you can get it where the thread will get will wrap around. The inside of the cap? The inside of the cap. I've had that happen when I first started sewing. It'll catch on the, if it's not the right, if it's, if, if the spool, let's say you have one of those little 
um, those narrow spools, like a sulky or a, a, what was it, Guterman, uses the narrow ones. If you have a cap that's too big, when the spool pulls off, it may wrap around the pin behind the cap. Um, if you have a cap that's too small on, say, a Coates and Clark, it may snag on the little snag on the edge of the, 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 the spool. Um, and then on top of it, sometimes if you just have excess thread, it'll just come off of the cap and uh, wrap around here and get caught. And then, then you might break a needle, you might break a thread. Everybody's like, what the heck happened? They're looking down here because this is where the problem happened, the symptom. But it re in reality, the thread got caught and held here and, and it caused the problem. This is what one of the smaller caps look like right here. And this is kind of what I use for uh, using, um, say, like uh, an embroidery thread. There you go. Yeah, indeed. You know, and you've got a narrower, uh, smaller diameter top. I think you want to make sure you use the appropriate size cap yeah, for it. The, and, and the idea is you want to basically just be a little larger than the leadoff end of it, you know. Uh, so, for instance, yeah. There you go. And... Now, and this is a, these, these spools right here, are, uh, see, it's a little rough on the edge. Every once in a while you get a little, a little bit of flash, and if you use a, a cap that's too small, it's going to catch that. You might catch the on the edge of the spool. Right, like this spool right here, I think I, uh, this spool right here, the edge cracked. Yeah, there you go. So if you're not using the right size cap and it's feeding yeah. off of the spool, mm -hmm. then you're going to yeah. possibly break so, it. Yeah, that, so, so a thread lead-off problem can cause tension, it can cause broken needle problems, um, and that's basically what we're talking about. And, and you can have too big of a cap, too. There's an even larger size than this. Yeah, and I, I can't if find you it. I'm it looking on, for it. It's in here somewhere. If you I use it on use this it end, you may have a problem with lead-off. Okay. All right, so we got over the kinds of problems that we could see that related to tension and related to threading. Um, and I guess the other half of, of the tension equation would be the, the bobbin case tension. Um, and, and if you have a uh, bad bobbin case tension, you may see uh, the thread pull to the top of the fabric. It, it may not be as dramatic as if you had bad top tension, which could actually cause damage to a machine if it gets in the wrong place. Usually if you have bad bobbin case tension, you get like what I call like little nubs. Almost like the, the thread is laying flat on the fabric and you can see these like little, little eyelashes. Yeah, yeah. Little, yeah from, from yeah, the bottom. In the video that I just posted on tension, I've got a good shot of that. And it really So is that all controlled? I mean, the bottom of tension, the, obviously it controls both, but is there something specific that uh, controls the you, bottom tension you, other than the wheel here? All you can control is, in, in, this, in this tug of war match between tensions, you can only control one team. You can only control the top. The bottom is is preset. Okay. Uh, now, if you're if you're if you're slick and brave and smart, and you know how it works. You can set these tensions. A lot of modern machines, though, don't want you to do that. Um, it, in old school, they used to include screwdrivers in your kits to adjust your tension because they had little manuals that explained all that and they figure in 1920 when you're on the farm in the countryside you're not going to have a technician so you got to be able to do this stuff right. but now we've got these nifty little plastic bobbin cases and you, you probably can't see this here but they have a little bit of green paint on them okay that's their way of this is the tension adjusting screw for this bobbin case um, and if we wanted to we could adjust the tension here Wow, they I, put, I had no idea of that. And they all. put the paint on there, to, for one, to keep the screw from backing off to maintain the tension a lot of time. Tight. But at the same time, they also know if you tampered with it. Okay. Um, but uh, Oh, is it actual tape? No. no it's, it, oh, it's just it's, like it's, it's kind of like a Loctite okay, kind of yeah. And I've seen different colors. It's different. Like Vikings had a different couple of versions of these, and each one, they had different tension settings, and one was blue and one was white. Or maybe it was even Brother. But, um, okay, so... The things that can go wrong with a bobbin case tension is most often it's either misadjusted, it fell apart, or uh, there's lint in there, or you, or you just didn't thread it or you threaded it incorrectly. And if there's lint in there, you can check one of the other videos that I got up that cover yeah. how to clean out the yeah. bobbin case area. Yeah, and, and, and sometimes it gets pinched right in between the springs here. There's like little leaf springs you have, that are pushing against uh, one another, which the thread goes in between. Uh, the only real way to get in there is if you had a, you know, I, I honestly think like a, a, a needle would do it in this, with this particular kind of case, you could take a, a, a needle and just, or I should say a pen actually, a fine pen, 
you can get right in there between the leaves and pull it out. If you're brave. If you don't, if you're not sure, take it to a shop. Um, now, I know these brushes are worn out here. Is that, do I have to worry about well, that at all? Or I, I, in your that? case, I'm not sure this is really worn out. This, this, this felt here is basically, it's just meant to um, give just a little bit of resistance at, at, on the thread as the stitch is formed a, around the bobbin case. And that kind of keeps the thread from flying willy-nilly all over inside there and getting caught on something. It kind of, kind of just dampens all that that motion a little, just enough. Um, it also, it looks like you've had a needle hit here. Actually, at some point you must have yeah. bent. I was, I was doing a project and, recently, and I just about broke this damn. Thing. And that, well, and that's a common thing, you know. These these plastic bobbin cases, um, they run nice and quiet. They're really easy to thread. So there are tons of modern advantages, and I'm not gonna say you should have a metal one instead. Um, but one of the risks is if it gets out of place, the rotating parts in the machine can dig into it, uh, and you'd see that along the edges. I've, I've had to replace a lot of bobbin cases of this style. Are those expensive? Not just brother. Or are they not too bad. Um, they range from uh, seven to sixty dollars, depending on your make. Really? But I mean, this this looks. If I threw a handful of bobbin cases on the floor from all different makes, you probably would have a hard time picking out the Singer one, the Brother one, the Viking one, because they all are generally reminiscent of this style okay. these days, of the lay flat bobbin sure. case. Um, they're also, uh, some people are probably more familiar with the little metal one that you you take out from, from in front underneath. It would be down here on some models, um, and, and that that's that's a whole different hook system altogether. But you're, you're probably going to run into this lay flat most often. Okay. And, and some of these principles, they, they, they apply no matter what. So to make sure you got it threaded right, um, and you wouldn't have it in your hand naturally, but um, most machines, when you lay it in, there's like a little part where it, where it hooks in the bobbin case. You probably covered this in the other video. Yeah, well, this one has a threading system right here. Oh yeah, yeah, they have that, a diagram too. Yeah, and it, it yeah. just basically, just basically, you, you pop the bobbin in, bobbin in. You make sure mm -hmm. the thread right here, as the as the bobbin picture shows, is mm -hmm. coming off of, coming off of it counterclockwise, mm -hmm. and then you just loop it underneath this little ear here, mm -hmm. and then it comes through, and it's got a built-in cutter, and that's cut it. it. Yep. Yeah, and it cuts it to just the right length, so that when you just start sewing, it pulls up just enough and. Um, I always, I always like that. that. That's kind of a. That's pretty neat. That's kind of a, neat, a feature that they invented while I was fixing them. It didn't used to exist well when I started. Um, but, but with your machine, and this, this pays. It, your most machines are like this. It may vary, but if, if you figure out how to uh, uh, thread your bobbin properly, and then you just look once and remember, on your machine, you know you got it in right because it's spinning counterclockwise. Okay. See that? Yeah, and there's a little metal. Um, lip or a little catch right there that it actually that's that, right that's what this guides it to ultimately yeah yeah say. and 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 that's just it here is another example just like where we were talking up top where they put all these nice little guides that have everything fall into place same thing with these with uh, newer bobbin case uh, uh, bobber cases where where you just you go in there and it's easy threading you know I remember yeah. the Viking it was a big deal with them when when they got into that well I remember when I was a kid I used to and we used to joke about this when I was when we were younger when you're doing your sewing machine repair but I used to tell you that I used to thread my grandmother's I always had to thread her needle and thread her bobbin you know and it was <laughs> oh, like, yeah. you remember thread my bobbin um, so that was like a big thing that uh, I always had to do as a kid. And I don't know if that's what led me here now or, or what, but it was a totally different, nothing was easy. I mean, you literally had to like go through a couple of hoops and hooks and uh, eye holes and get it into the needle. And yeah. then the bobbin part was trying to get it caught. Yeah. You know, and you it was practically nothing had, like this. Practically had to be a technician to run it. If, since we're talking about bobbin cases and uh, on a technician level, um, you may be brave enough to take your bobbin case out. It depends how easy it is. Uh, if, if it's no, if, if it's not much more than two screws on a plate, you can you can take your and, and Tim's lucky enough that we can remove the, uh, uh, the slide plate here or whatever you want to call that now. It used to be called a slide plate, um, and and just pop the bobbin case right out. Uh, sometimes you may have to remove a plate, and and, and some machines just aren't going to let you do it. You know, some don't want you to do it. Um, but if you can get the if you can get this out, um, you can inspect the outer edge. You know, make sure there's no deep gouges. 
Uh, I mean, as one needle hit here, which creates a rough spot, but fortunately, it's out of the way of any of the thread paths, so it's inconsequential. It yeah. really doesn't cause I mean, I would have never even known I hit the needle there. No, and I, I think even if had I the next yeah. time I clean this, yeah. but, if, but if, you're certified. If, if you had a bunch of needle hits like that, I might take a file and, and just file it down so it's smooth. Okay. But I would be really more concerned about the outer edge. If the outer edge is really gouged badly, it could snag. Um, and right here, there's a lot of these bobbin cases have like a little... I don't know, what do you call it? A bumper finger, I suppose. And it bumps against a little spring. And a lot of them are like this. I mean, Vikings, Singers, Brothers, New Homes. I, I, and, and that's usually where the wear will occur or the problem will occur. This little finger will get jacked up in a bad jam or the edge. And then once you get it back in there, the thread doesn't go smoothly. Maybe your machine is louder. You hear a lot more clacking down there. Um, you may need a new bomb case. Um, and on that... On that note, it's always good to ask a technician for the parts he replaced. You should, when you drop off a machine for repair, you should always, whatever they claim they replaced, you should get those old parts back. Wow, that's a great idea. You need to see what it is they replaced because I've known of enterprises that were less than honest. honest. I'm going to go ahead and cut the video here for part one. I'll air part two next week. I hope you guys really enjoyed the video. Uh, let me know what you thought in the comments below. I've got some really neat Halloween embroidery projects coming up in the next couple weeks, so check back for that. Subscribe if you haven't. I'm Purified, and as always, thanks for watching Burley So.